we hope to uh, illustrate the use of this relatively new technology, which has really changed the way in which we treat calcified lesions. So we've got Holger Neff from Marburg, we've got Marek Ferenc from Brad Gottsigan, and we've got Tom, from, uh, Tom Johnson from Bristol. And we're going to talk about some cases, we're going to show the technology in, act in action, and then we can discuss perhaps how this technology has broadened a little bit uh, the cases that we can treat, but perhaps more importantly, improve the results that we can expect to get. And I think that's really one of the important messages and perhaps improve the safety for our patients too. So with that, I'm going to turn to Holger, if I may. Holger, you're going to talk to us about rocks in hard places, principle of lithotripsy, current IVL data, and indications in calcified coronary lesions. Thank you very much for, your, for joining us, and we look forward to your talk. Dear Chairman, thank you for the invitation to present at the EBC 2021. The title of my presentation is Principle of IVL, Current IVL Data and Indications in Calcified Coronary Lesions. Regarding the stent-orientated goals after PCI, the efficient stent delivery is essential. Thus, we have learned also from intervascular imaging that the good mechanical results can be achieved when MSA is greater than 80 or 90% with an absolute MSA greater than 5.5 square millimeter if dissection is not present, luck burden at the edge and malaposition should also be avoided. Well, from several studies, we know that an adequate stent implantation can reduce clinical events and of course, symptoms on the one hand side, but also often results during lesion preparation, which is mandatory to achieve such a good results in procedural complication. So balloons have an insufficient force to crack calcium, often results in barotrauma or balloon rupture. Also, atherobletive strategy are also limited by a wire bias, only potential resulting in slow flow situation or even perforation. Taken this into account, intravascular lithotripsy has been introduced, especially in lesions where calcium angle is more than 180 degrees and calcium thickness is more than 0.5 millimeter. Additional consideration using IVL are vessel with a um, lesion and a large procedural lumen more than two millimeters, or ortho osteo lesions, or of course bifurcations. The intravascular lithotripsy comes with a balloon catheter and a generator. The generator produces energy, which are applied by the emitters in the balloon catheter. A small electrical discharge at the emitters vaporizes the fluid within the balloon to create rapidly expanding bubbles that generate the sonic pressure waves and then collapses within a few microseconds. When waves impact the calcium at nearly 50 atmosphere, they create a series of microfractures and then makes the vessel more compliant. Here you can see the effect of lithotripsy either in OCT, here you can see the microfractures, or in IVAS. In the latest data coming from the CAF3 trial, IVL showed a high safety endpoint. The primary endpoint, which was freedom from MAID within 30 days, was observed in 92. 0.2%. The lower confidence boundary of 89.9% meets the performance goal. Here you can see the clinical endpoints, which were rather low. However, there was a high success rate after treatment with IVL. Finally, I want to show a clinical case 
which shows a um, severe calcified lesion, uh, which is nicely demonstrated of in the intravascular imaging, um, which was OCT in the right coronary artery. And um, IL treatment was then applied here in the severe calcified lesion, which uh, results in a high compliance of the former stenosed vessel. So the IVL treatment leads led to better vessel compliance after creating the microfractures resulting in an adequate stent expansion. So therefore I like to conclude adequate stent deployment following after optimal lesion preparation is mandatory for better clinical outcomes. Conventional strategies in severe coronary calcification might be insufficient and therefore intervascular lithotripsy offers an alternative treatment to ensure optimal stent deployment, thereby demonstrating efficacy and safety. Thank you very much. Opportunity to discuss these presentations shortly, but we're going to take the next presentation from Marek, uh, who is live, I think, in Brussels. And Marek's going to talk to us about uh, Rocks in hard places, advantages of IVL for optimal lethal preparation and calcified coronary bifurcation lesions. Hi, Merrick, good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you. And uh, really, I'm only uh, one from this group here in Brussels. So, um, yeah, we have to treat in many cases um, also calcified coronary bifurcation lesions. And as you can see here, um, according to our data from more than two 1,100 patients with uh, coronary bifurcation lesions from our uh, registry data, we will find in uh, up to 5% really severe calcified coronary lesions. And if you follow such patients up to three years, you will find in every third patient the need for TLR and in, including MACE. So the lesion preparation is uh, ex extremely crucial. So you, you can go ahead with standard balloons. Um, you can use cutting or scoring balloons. They are, of course, uh, also a bit um, bulky. But uh, if you go by um, standard approach, you can use two wires. In, you can have two wires in position. If you have to prepare a lesion with uh, the bulking technical approach, like rotablation or orbital atherectomy, the point is uh, very clear. Then you have to remove at least uh, remove one wire so you have only one wire in position and again if you start such uh, uh, debulking approach lesion preparation with a shockwave balloon with ivl we have a definitely advantage to have two wires in position and please always if you see such very difficult um, anatomy uh, then um, there was a very clear um, need for uh, difficult recrossing. Um, you s have to go sometimes from retrograde approach. And uh, as you can see here in this, um, uh, in this LAD um, circ bifurcation lesions, and if you try this a um, few times, you can even lose um, uh, side branch or even uh, damage um, completely the patient. So always if you use this all, uh, staff like Svenek guide uh, or supercross macro procedure with difficult side branch access, please uh, think two wires in position will be very useful. And if you have to go with, uh, let's say, orbital or rotor blade, you have to remove one wire. If you go with um, predilatation uh, with shockwave balloon, after you prepare the lesion with 1.5 or better 2.0 balloon, just to make a channel for a shockwave balloon, then you will be uh, on the safest way and you have here both uh, vessels wired. And uh, sometimes uh, there is a guiding extension needed. So then uh, you can go uh, with, usually you start with one balloon, a shockwave balloon for the main branch or larger uh, branch and um, can exchange to um, the side branch or you take se uh, second one. 
And of, after this lesion preparation, you can um, use even all these technical uh, strategies. And this is just an example for this is the left main uh, after rota shockwave treatment. And um, this is uh, a case uh, which I present, uh, severe calcification in LAD. And what we want to achieve, as uh, Holger just nicely showed, this uh, fractures in, in the plaque and also to achieve really good uh, stent expansion. And this is a case um, of um, the LAD and diagonal branch uh, lesion, which uh, we recorded with uh, IVL. And the problem was here, there was um, initially uh, the idea the first diagonal branch is really large. However, it was uh, a bit smaller than the second one and according to the um, complete revascularization, we went ahead here with um, lesion preparation. You will see now uh, very soon this uh, complex bifurcation lesion. There are three diagonal branches. The first one is subtotal and calcified, severe calcified lesion. So it was not possible to go with um, um, OCT catheter, so it was needed to prepare the lesion. Finally, we have done this and saw this um, picture, um, this movie of this uh, critical segment uh, of uh, LAD, and it was clear we have to uh, go here with um, the bulking technical approach. And because of this angulation to the first diagonal branch, we decided to uh, go here with shockwave balloon. Here you can see um, um, eight, um, eight times we could um, give energy here. And this is uh, now, um, again, a view with uh, fractures, as we could see um, before in Holger's speech. Um, and finally, we could stand, uh, go with stand ahead. It was a, a dicky crash. Um, postulate it uh, distally, make it um, final keys, final pot. And uh, you can see this um, patient uh, was uh, finally uh, treated um, by um, IVL, double stenting, and checked by OCT. We put it one more stent in proximal area because of some uh, dissection. And now you can see um, in final shot the final uh, result. And um, this was, I think, very acceptable result. Really not huge uh, first diagonal branch, but according to this uh, distal LAD, which was um, also stenosed, I think now all side branches are perfectly open. Um, so this is a final shot. And so in uh, coronary bifurcation lesions, uh, IVL is really feasible and safe due to two wires position. So you have a wire, permanent wire position in the main branch and side branch. In some cases, um, you have to perform rotor shock or orbital shock uh, approach. And imaging is definitely very uh, helpful and I think uh, um, John will, uh, Tom will um, show us in next uh, presentation the importance of imaging. Thank you. Thanks, Marek. That was great. And uh, it's, it's really interesting looking at the result angiographically that you got in that case. And I would contend it probably couldn't get that result without this shockwave technology. It really was an extraordinary result in the, in the main vessel. Because um, one of the things about... Uh, Rotablation, obviously, is it gives you a channel, but it doesn't necessarily, well, we know it doesn't disrupt the adventitial and medial calcification in the same way as this technology. Tom, you're going to talk to us about imaging, uh, rocks in hard places, the role of imaging in calcified bifurcation. Thank you very much. We look forward to your talk. Dear Chairman, thank you for the kind invitation to present at this year's EBC. My presentation is entitled Rocks in Hard Places, the Role of Imaging in Calcified Bifurcation. The objective of my presentation is to define where imaging fits in algorithmic approach, the criteria we may use to guide intervention, real-world experience, where perhaps qualitative calcium characterization will uh, further advance our decision-making, and the role of imaging in planning and mitigating the challenges of treating rocks in hard places. There's data out there to highlight the significance of both presence of calcification and bifurcation, which are closely associated, 
And here we see from the Mount Sinai group a very high rate of periprocedural myocardial infarction, particularly in the combined presence of calcification and bifurcation. They used relatively high rates of rotational atherectomy, almost 50% in this cohort, but it must be criticized that actually imaging use was relatively uh, rare with, with less than 10% uh, being uh, guided by IVUS or OCT. It's therefore gratifying to see in the most contemporary algorithmic approach by Margaret McIntaggart and James Spratt that imaging plays a very central role in decision making. And why is that? Well, we know from this uh, rather elegant series looking at a uh, patient cohort who had angiography and IVUS and OCT that angiography identifies calcium in just less than half of patients, where OCT and then actually IVUS best of all identifies a, far, a, a much more significant cohort. When it comes to comparing IVUS and OCT, actually they're fairly well matched in terms of assessment of calcium angle. Obviously, OCT has the potential for uh, assessing uh, calcific thickness, although reverberation artifact by IVUS may be a surrogate of that. Why is that important? Well, there's data out to show that where we have an arc exceeding 180 degrees, a thickness of more than 500 micron, an extension over more than five millimeters, that we can very accurately predict stent under expansion. In this uh, validation, we see that 30% you know, of uh, stents fail to achieve a 70% expansion where all three of these criteria are met. There's been some very elegant work done by the Light Lab Initiative looking at the impact of OCT in uh, 12 uh, centers in the States. It must be acknowledged that it seems that direct stenting is, is often used in uh, the United States. And so as a consequence, OCT identifying calcium resulted in a change in decision-making in almost a half of patients, either taking a compliant or non-compliant balloon, but then also advancing uh, your decision to use of a cutting or a scoring balloon in a quarter and taking atherectomy or laser in a further 25%. Where no change in device was uh, made, actually the majority were having fairly aggressive uh, strategies uh, deployed anyhow. But we saw overall an uptick in the use of aggressive calcium modification from 3% to over a quarter, 27%. In our practice in, in Bristol, actually across uh, four years, we've seen an interesting increase in intravascular imaging in orange here with rotational atherectomy. You see a drop in volume in 2019, and that was due to the um, uh, receipt of IVL in 2018, where we took a departmental uh, strategy to use imaging in the vast majority of our cases. And now you can see that in over 80% of all of our uh, calcium modification cases, we are reliant upon imaging in both detailing the extent, but also ensuring adequate modification and optimization of our stent result. Beyond that, I think there is a role for the, for the need to characterize calcium. And here, very beautifully shown in a cohort of over 1,200 ACS patients, we see that there are a number of different types of calcium that we may have to treat. Superficial calcific sheet, eruptive calcified nodule, calcified protrusion. And it may be that we need to use different adjunctive technology or combinations of adjunctive technology when faced with this type of calcium. So my personal approach is an image-guided one. Where uncrossable, I'll be using rotablation. Where we see evidence of significant burden of calcification, according to the criteria I've identified, then firstly, actually, I'll palpate with a non-compliant balloon. But if there's failure to yield, then and if the imaging shows calcified protrusion, then I'll look to debulk. In the presence of more circumferential calcium, then I'll turn to IVL for the purpose of fracture with further imaging to, to identify uh, effective uh, modification. Let me show you a case. This is a 71-year-old with stable angina, but symptoms persisting despite optimal medical therapy. Right coronary is dominant and relatively free of disease. Circumflex has some mid-vessel disease, which is FFR negative. And then we see in this cranial projection really very uh, significant and extensive disease of the LAD, affecting a large first diagonal branch and also a septal branch more distally. We took a uh, decision to treat the proximal bifurcation by complex two stent and provisional approach to the septal LAD complex more distally. So predilatation and then imaging of both limbs, and here I show you the OCT of the diagonal, 
which shows rather elegantly sparing of the carina as we'd expect pathophysiologically with calcium in the diagonal that may only need further palpation. But in the LED, we see circumferential calcification over a uh, very extensive length and more uh, thick than 500 micron. And so uh, immediately take IVL uh, with delivery of 40 pulses and importantly by OCT show very significant fracture and modification. So embark upon stenting distally with a 2.5 by 28, stenting into the diagonal with again a DK collot technique. So proximal optimization again with a 3.5 balloon, OCT confirmation of wire passage into the LAD, kissing, followed by then the proximal LAD stent. Now, interestingly, the OCT actually shows that the stent inadvertently extends back into the left main. But fortunately, you know, we've taken a 3.5 device that will expand to five millimeters in that left main stem to achieve stent apposition. And here we see the final result with gratifyingly fantastic stent coverage at the level of the complex D1 LED bifurcation, uh, expansion of our stent to five millimeters in the left main, and an MSA in that proximal segment where we had high grade calcification of 10.2. So in summary, rocks in hard places, they associate bifurcation and calcification associate and are related to poor outcome. It's essential we recognize calcification to ensure good result. Imaging is better than angiography, and we now have criteria that we must use to ensure we avoid stent under expansion. IVL is a fantastic disruptive technology, and we must be seeking to avoid acute stent under expansion to avoid late stent failure and achieve best outcome for our patients. I thank you for your attention. That was great. Uh, thanks, Tom. Um, so there's a question from uh, our online audience. Uh, perhaps I could ask you this, Holder. Uh, what's, what's the role of lithotripsy when you haven't got 180 degrees of calcium? Do you think the technology is still likely to be effective or, or, or not? Well, well, we have looked at the uh... Uh, patients on, on the CAT1 and CAT2 um, patients uh, cohort um, where we have the differentiate between the um, uh, between an eccentric and an concentric uh, eccentric lesion um, below 180 degree in some cases and um, as well as in the concentric uh, we sh showed that IVL is also effective in the eccentric lesion and um, this is uh, somehow I, I would also recommend however um, in some cases you do not need the uh, IVL of course uh, when the um, calcification is below 180 degrees but you can be sure that you have also the effect if you use IVL in eccentric lesions as it is also um, effective in concentric lesions. Uh, what we did not know so far is uh, how to treat uh, calcified nodules as shown showed by uh, uh, Tom in his talk. And uh, I, I don't believe that we have the right tool so far um, available for the calcified nodule. Maybe it's orbital arterectomy. However, um, IVL also in this kind of lesions is not working very well. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, that's certainly my, uh, my understanding about the nodule as well. I'm not sure we really have the right tool. I think one of the things that we tend to, uh, as interventional cardiologists, we think about the lesion and we sort of consider there's going to be three millimeters of concentric calcium and that's the only bit we're going to treat. And one of the comments that you made, which I enjoyed, is how lithotripsy changes the compliance of the vessel throughout the length that you treat. And it actually then makes the stent delivery and uh, easier and then your ultimate stent uh, expansion easier. And it's the whole vessel that you end up treating um, because ultimately, quite commonly in rotablation, it's not the little bit where the calcium was on the angiogram where the burr starts to really bite, it's further down. You know, the whole vessel is always very calcified, isn't it? And this, is, and this is a way really of treating the whole vessel, which is ultimately what the patient wants. But I'm gonna ask um, perhaps Marek, what's your, been your experience with perforation? Do you think that uh, we're making these procedures safer using lithotripsy? Definitely. Uh, we, so I, we, we do a lot of cases in Bad Kreuzung, so usually more than 3,000 a year. So I saw in the last 10 years only one uh, perforation in, in bifurcation lesion. So we could manage this um, by a covered stand. Um, very, very um, low low rate of possible complications using IVL. And from my perspective, it's really very 
simple tool also in smaller hospital, hospitals where doctors are not extremely skilled in rotablation and orbital atherectomy using IVL, they can even go uh, to distal left main to bifurcation lesions. So complications like slow flow or even some um, problems with uh, worth, uh, rhythm um, uh, are very, very seldom. So from my uh, perspective, uh, we have now one more tool in our hands to manage uh, calcified uh, bifurcation lesions in a better way and safer. Well, we, we, we won't forget that the balloon, the IVL balloon, is also ruptured, is ruptured sometimes, and uh, even in um, very uh, calcified lesions. So I have also experienced sometimes that the balloon is ruptured. Um, well, this has to keep in mind that, uh, well, in some cases, you have to go for the rod ablation, of course, and the balloon That's is clear. not uh, the, the, the right tool. Yes, we've certainly seen that. Uh, finally, Tom, in, uh, if you were treating a calcified bifurcation, would you routinely then lithotripsy both the, the, uh, the LED and diagonal? Would you use the, the balloon in both branches straight away, or would, would you be differential about that? I would be entirely guided by the imaging, I have to say, Adrian, which which I think is the approach that we've now adopted, having, with the arrival of IVL, institutionally agreed that we would increase our imaging use. And actually, that's just led to a more intellectual kind of process as to how we should be treating it. And Marek highlights it's another tool. It's been the most instrumental tool, but it is one of a number that we probably have to institute. And so... Um, I, I struggle a bit when you see on social media and you hear others talking about this is the answer. It, it, it is, it's made a stepwise change to what we can do, but it has to be seen amongst the other technologies. Um, and, and so I think you have to be guided by, by what we see. And unfortunately, the angiogram doesn't tell us much of what we're really trying to treat. So my message, I'm afraid, is a, is a kind of ongoing one, which is you use the imaging to guide the therapy. Um, so just because I've taken the balloon won't mean I'll, I'll then use it down both limbs. I'll use it where I see concentric calcification or a heavy burden of calcium that's going to impact on my stent expansion. That's very clear and very useful. I mean, I think that's been a fantastic uh, overview of our joint experience with, with lithotripsy. I think it offers, um, you know, very commonly, we had to treat this ca challenging calcific disease with inappropriate tools or inadequate tools more accurately. But I think we now do have this expanded armamentarium. And I think it has led to uh, a real stepwise improvement in the sort of results we can get. And my sense is it's also making things safer. And clearly that's important to everybody and particularly our patients. So with that, I'd like to thank Holger, Marek, and Tom for their participation and for our colleagues online and hand you back to uh, the rest of the uh, EBC 2021. Thank you very much.